My name is Diogo Monica. I'm the security lead at Docker, and today I want to talk a little bit about secure substrate, building the Moby Whale. So this is kind of a cryptic title, which I hope will be very clear at the last slide of this presentation, why I use this actual slide. And before I go into the talk itself, just want to talk a little bit about me. I do like motorcycles, and I do like uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, but as a day job, I run the security team at Docker, show of hands, how many people actually use Docker in the audience? OK, show of hands, how many people actually use computers in the audience? About the same. That's good. <laughs> Before Docker, I actually used to work for a company called Square. Square is an infrastructure company that does payments. And I was there for four years building cryptography. And before Square, and it's not shown in the slide because it's a little bit embarrassing, but I was doing a PhD in uh, distributed systems because I wanted my dad to love me. That totally failed, so. Okay, after I wasted too many years of my PhD, I started working in security, and now today, I want to talk to you about some stuff that we've been working at Docker. In particular, I want to start with this terminal. This terminal is uh, pretty in the first place, but the second thing that it's showing is it's showing you a Docker stack deploy, which is a one command that feeds from a YAML file and deploys a set of microservices. What it's actually doing when you do a Docker deploy, for those of you that are familiar with it, is it creates networks for you, it runs microservices, connects them all to each other, sets up all the environmental variables, runs these containers, then all of a sudden, by running one command, you have a full working infrastructure. Database, your uh, in-memory store, your application, your workers, doesn't matter what it is, you can actually have a full infrastructure with one command. The reason why I'm showing you this is this is really easy. But just because it's easy, it does not mean that it's simple. So today my talk is about what is actually under the hood and to show you what is actually happening under the hood when you do this command. In particular, we're going to look at all the pieces that are necessary for Docker Stack Deploy to work securely. And one analogy that I actually really like to use is Tetris. Show of hands, those of you that have played Tetris? OK, about the same people that use Docker, so that's great. Tetris is a really simple game. As you know, the goal of the game is to have these tetronomos, which is actually, turns out, is the official name for those little things, tetronomos. I thought that was cool. Tetronomos have to be piled up in a way that they create full lines. They don't leave any gaps. That's the purpose of the game. Whenever you have a full line, the line disappears, and you get to continue playing. If they all pile up, and you're full of holes, then you lose. The reason why I'm using Tetris as an analogy is because it turns out that Tetris is like infrastructure security. If you leave holes, you have vulnerabilities. So today, I want to talk about tetronomos. And specifically, I want to talk about the seven tetronomos that are related to security that Docker has actually created. Each of them has a different purpose. Each of them impacts security in some way. And each of them is going to contribute to the final platform and to the final Docker stack deploy working under the hood in a secure fashion. So there's seven different tetronomos. Each of these tetronomos is actually an open source software. So you can go to GitHub and see every single one of these as an independent project. We have InfraKit, which is a way to manage infrastructure in an infrastructure-independent way. LinuxKit, which allows you to build OSs. We have RunC, which is a container runtime. We have ContainerD, which is a container supervisor. We have Docker itself, which is a container execution platform. Notary, that allows you to do signing. And finally, SwarmKit, which is a container orchestrator. And so, I'm going to go into every single one of them and talk to you about the security properties that they have and why you should be excited. And one thing that I want to mention is that every single one of these pieces are supposed to be able to operate independently. You can use them and compose them however you like. And throughout the presentation, I'm going to show you exactly this. So let's go to the first one. Let's talk a little bit about InfraKit. What is InfraKit? InfraKit is actually one of the most recent tetronomos that Docker has created in open source projects. 
And what it allows you to do is it allows you to have infrastructure-independent machine management. And what I mean by this is that it doesn't really matter what cloud provider you're using. You can be using local infrastructure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Azure. It doesn't really matter. InfraKit allows you to create virtual machines, manage the lifecycle of these virtual machines, the operating system, so on and so forth. The reason why that's a good idea is because you have one tool, one declarative tool, YAML-based, that allows you to control all of your machines. And cloud migration becomes really easy. And cloud management becomes really easy because it's an independent platform that you get to operate on. InfraKit has a few details that I think are particularly interesting from a security perspective and just from a usability perspective. The first one is declarative updates. So I think a lot of you are familiar with declarative infrastructure and the concept where you have infrastructure as code. You define a file, a configuration file, that sets what the infrastructure is supposed to be, and once you commit that, something happens that ensures that your infrastructure is in the state that you want it, that it hasn't diverged, that it actually has not changed. It's exactly what you defined as your configuration that your infrastructure represents. InfraKit does this for the actual machine management. And it is pretty cool because declarative updates allow you to actually say, for example, the version of the operating system you're running across your virtual machines. So with InfraKit, you could have a file that says, I want five instances of this machine running this Linux operating system. Then if you want to update the operating system, the only thing you have to do is you change in the file the version you want to change, you commit, and then InfraKit will understand that the version is mismatching that you want a new version of the Linux operating system, and then we'll auto-update it for you using rolling deploys. What this allows you to do, and what I would like you to have as a security metric, is a concept called reverse uptime that I've been talking a little bit about lately. So what is reverse uptime, and why should you care about it as a security metric? Well, reverse uptime is the concept where instead of you being proud about the uptime of a server. Oh, I have a server that has been up for 12 years. Isn't that cool? Instead of following that mentality of like 15 years ago, what you now follow is the reverse of that. You're excited when the oldest server of your infrastructure has been alive for a week, for an hour. That is something to be proud of. Something that has been alive for 12 years, not so much. And the reason why this is important tracking the concept of reverse uptime as a metric, is because it turns out that drift in virtual machines and OSs is one of the biggest causes of downtime. So if you're constantly refreshing your machines, if you have a maximum bound of one week, all my machines cannot be older than one week, and you have something like InfraKit, then you will ensure that your operating system is constantly being rotated, new virtual machines are being created to meet this dependency of a week old virtual machine. And that removes drift. Machines can't drift if they're constantly coming from a golden image, if they're constantly being created from a fresh ISO, from a fresh AMI, they can't drift from each other. And from a security perspective, that it was an ops perspective, management of uptime and drift, but from a security perspective, this is amazing. How can you backdoor an image that constantly gets refreshed? You can't have persistence if a hacker gets in. It can't have pers persistence on the host because the image keeps getting updated. The other side of reverse of time is great. We're tracking the time, the oldest time of the machine that has been alive. But the other thing that we have to do is we have to constantly update our golden image. So another metric that goes alongside reverse of time is golden image freshness. In this one, you always want to have the freshest image. You always want to update your golden image, your AMI, your ISO. And by doing so, having these two metrics together, you know that your infrastructure is always up to date. So things like patching kernel are done automatically. Because since you are tracking reverse of time and creating new machines from a golden image that is patched as soon as possible, then necessarily you have an infrastructure that has the latest patches, the latest kernel, and therefore is more secure. The way that we can do this, or the reason why we can do this, is because InfraKit allows you to do rolling deploys. I think you're familiar with rolling deploys uh, within load balancers, the context of applications and load balancers. The same concept could actually be applied for machines. If you're running an orchestrator, then it's actually pretty easy to take the workload from one host, move it to the other one, 
shut down the old host, and create a new one. And this is what InfraKit does for you. It manages this dependency and allows you to effectively warn the hosts that they're about to be shut down, removes the workloads from those hosts, shuts down those hosts, and creates one fresh one from the golden image. So this is something that you need to obviously support this kind of mentality around tracking reverse subtime. So that's InfraKit. Now let's talk about the next piece of open source software, LinuxKit. LinuxKit is not an operating system. LinuxKit is not, is not Ubuntu. What LinuxKit does is it actually builds an operating system for you. So think of it as an operating system builder. An analogy that we can actually make is the same way that Docker, like a Docker image format, is not an image. It is a something that allows you to build an image, and you have a Docker file that tells your Docker how to build this image, right? You can always rebuild it, and you'll have an image to be able to deploy. Linux Kit does the same thing, but for operating systems. So as declarative infra infrastructure, as a declarative YAML file, you say exactly what you want from your operating system. In this case, you say that you want a kernel with a certain version. You want this init system. On boot, you want to run the HCP, and you want to run it with these flags, and you want to make sure that you're trusting the organization Linux Kit for security. In this case, that means that these things have to become and be signed by us, Docker. And once you have this, you tell Linux Kit to build it, and Linux Kit will give you an ISO, an AMI. It will give you something for you to run. So it just built an operating system for you just in time. Why is this cool? Well, the same way that we always tell you to run minimal containers, run containers that are the smallest possible, that have the least amount of stuff in them, minimize the attack surface, really, really small, megabyte-sized containers. The same thing applies for operating systems. Why would you have hundreds of system packages? Why would you have hundreds of unused binaries? Why would you have that kind of exposure? Why would you have gigabytes of an operating system where you need 1% of? And so Linux Kit follows the principle of least privilege, and in this case, only allows you or only puts inside of the final operating system exactly what you tell it to. So if we built the previous operating system with a SAML file, you're sure that that operating system will only have the HCP and will have the init system on a kernel that is 4.9.x. That's the only thing it will have. If you want anything else in it, you have to declare it. What this means is that it's a really minimal operating system, which is obviously a very secure operating system. It actually goes one step further, and it allows you to run your operating system in an immutable fashion. What that means is that the operating system will not be writable. It will only be readable. So if there's an attacker that gets to compromise your host and be on the operating system, there's, no, there's nothing that it can actually alter. There's no persistence. There's no changing binaries. There's no backdooring your SSH. Number one, we didn't have SSH because we didn't have that binary. And number two, it can't write to the actual operating system. So that further adds to security. Not only least privilege and least authority in terms of only the things that you need, you can't write to it. Other things that we do in Linux Kit, we try to incubate new projects that are up and coming and that are really additive from a security perspective. Things like Landlock LSM, which is a Linux security module that allows you to do eBPF and kernel. We obviously are adding WireGuard, which is a really secure alternative to IPsec. It is um, a VPN tunneling mechanism that is really small, 5,000 lines of code, and very, very well implemented, so secure, instead of IPsec with hundreds of thousands of lines of code. We are also going down the path of rewriting system daemons, such as DHCP, in memory-safe languages, like OCaml. What this means is that the things that you're adding to your operating system are no longer written in C, vulnerable to buffer overflows, they're written in a memory-safe language, which further minimizes your surface of exposure and your exposure to attacks from the outside. So this permeates throughout all of Linux Kit least privilege, minimal authority. A final thing that I want to say is that Linux Kit is not something esoteric and new. If you've, if you've used Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, you're actually using Linux Kit right now because the way that we build the operating system that is running inside of your Mac is with Linux Kit. So it's already deployed in millions of hosts today. That was Linux Kit. Now let me bring you to Run C. RunC is an open source software that allows you to have effectively a very lightweight container runtime. 
We've donated it to the OCI, so it's a standard at this point. And what RunC does is the simplest subcomponent of what a container actually is. A container at core is effectively a combination of multiple mechanisms that the Linux kernel provides to isolate a process, such as namespaces in C groups. So Run C is a piece of software that uses these underlying primitives, like namespaces in C groups in Linux, to create an isolated view of your process in the system. In the case of namespaces, what namespaces actually do is they get you an isolated view within your container of the system. So PID, mount namespace, IPC, net, what that means is that you'll be namespaced on all of these different components. The PID one being, when you're inside of a container, you cannot see the processes of anyone else. You can only see your, your own. So you're effectively namespaced. And for every single other subsystem in the kernel, there's a corresponding namespace that allows you to run in an isolated view inside of your container. And then the second biggest component that Run C takes care of for you is configure C groups. C groups is the way that we limit the resources that your containers actually have access to. So there are C groups for CPU, for memory, for PIDs, so on and so forth. Using C groups, we can mitigate against um, container just consuming all the processes in your host, or a container consuming all of the memory or all of the CPU. We're effectively resource constraining what the container can do. So these two subcomponents, there's more, but these two main subcomponents allow you to run a contains from memory, CPU, PID perspective, in isolated container inside of your OS. And that's what RunC actually does. And RunC is not particularly useful by itself. You can run containers manually, but you need something to supervise the containers. Is the container still executing? Is the container still running? Did it um, get out with an error code? Do, do we know what's happening? Can I rerun it? Should I rerun it? So we need something to supervise these containers. And this is why we created Container D. So Container D got donated to the CNCF and is now, um, again, not only open source code in a project, but is actually donated to a foundation. So the code no longer belongs to Docker, it belongs to the whole community of CNCF, the same way that RunC now belongs to the community of OCI. And so Container D, as I mentioned, we need a way to supervise these RunC containers. So we built this Tetronimo and this open source project to supervise them. And there's a lot of things that it does. Obviously, understanding if a container executed successfully, rerunning containers, scheduling, there's a lot of things that it does. It also allows you to pull images. So the image pulling component in execution inside of a Run-C container of an image is the job of, contain of Containerd. But from a security perspective, there's one thing that I want to point out that is particularly interesting that Containerd does, and that affects the security of your whole system. And it is about container pulls. So if you are running Docker and if you've used Docker before, you're definitely familiar with Docker pull. Docker pull is the way that you pull an image down to your hosts to actually execute it. And Docker pull usually looks something like Docker pull, nginx latest, the image comes, and now you can execute it inside of a run seat container. So, so far, so good. Pretty easy. But Docker pull, and specifically a pull method, can be done with a name, but it could also be done with a hash. And so instead of you saying that I want Nginx and I want the latest tag, you could say I want Nginx, but I want this specific cryptographic hash of the content that is remotely. The reason why this is cool is we're going to see in a little bit in Notary, which is the next Tetronimo. But the way that this works is if you provide a hash to download, if you say Docker pull or container D pull, a, con a container hash instead of a name, what's actually happening under the hood is you're using a content addressable system. So all the subcomponents of the container, different layers, they have hashes that all hash up to one main manifest hash. So what's actually happening is when you're saying, please download this specific hash of Nginx, the only thing you can get is a secure version of that content because there's a cryptographic hash that is being validated over the whole content of your container. So if you say Nginx latest, you're not sure what you're getting. But if you're saying Nginx in a specific hash, you know that you're getting exactly the hash that you requested. The reason why this is important becomes obvious in our next Tetronimo, Notary. Notary is an open source software that we just donated to the CNCF, so it just got approved um, a few days ago. 
and it allows you to do trusted software delivery. It is arbitrary trusted software delivery. It does not have necessarily to do with containers. But the way that it works is related to those hashes that I was describing. In particular, if you look back our image pool, we don't want to run pool nginx random hash of God knows how many characters that I didn't memorize. What I want to say is I want to pull the latest version of Nginx, or 1.1 of Nginx, or 1.5 of Nginx. So clearly, there needs to be something that translates this human-readable name, this version, latest, into a secure hash in a way that we can trust. And so that's the job of Notary. Notary is a generic system that we implemented into Docker, but it's a generic system that does one job really well. It translates names to secure cryptographic hashes. And it does so using digital signatures. And it has a lot of interesting problems or a lot of interesting um, characteristics that solves a lot of problems for software delivery. And there's an attacker model and a threat model that we have on the Notary page, and I recommend you to go see it. But one specific thing that I want to say about Notary is the fact that it allows you to have not just one digital signature. So if you had a GPG key, you would sign a piece of software with GPG. And then you would verify the authenticity of the software with one GPG key. And there's a lot of problems with that. Number one, if the software is out of date, you can't revoke the particular software that you signed. It will always be, as long as that key is valid, that piece of software would always be valid. With Notary, that doesn't work that way. And if you have just one GPG key, you only have the ability of signing with one key. If that key is compromised, you don't have an option as how to recover from it. And what if you have the need for multiple systems, a security team approval and an ops person approval? What then? Notary solves that problem by allowing you to have threshold signing. So what you can say with Notary is not just verify that this content is signed, but you can say, please verify that this content was signed by the CI system, by the staging system, by the security team, by the deployment system, can add as many as you want. And then the running system, the container, will only be executed if it got signed by every single one of these uh, entities in this threshold. So that's one of the biggest characteristics. And the other characteristic is in the GPG case, if you're signing software with just a pure application of GPG, if that key is compromised, you're effectively screwed. You have to go back and just reset all of the public key components. You have to redo the whole system. You have to send a new public key down to all of the hosts, effectively just go and modify every single host. With Notary, you have something called survivable key compromise. What that actually means is that if a key gets compromised, you can actually bring a root key that you always keep offline online to automatically rotate it, and you don't have to change anything on the final hosts. There are some technical components as to why this is really interesting, but from your perspective, the only thing that matters is that a key gets compromised in a CI staging, doesn't matter. Bring an off-like key online, rotate it, and in seconds, you're done. The old key no longer matters, an attacker no longer has anything of value. And that is something that is really important for you to have in every single system that you have that uses cryptographic keys. The ability of having survivable key compromise. And so this brings us to Docker. Because Docker does a lot of things, but Docker uses run C, the container execution, supervised by container D, the supervised platform, and Notary for secure image pools. And the combination of all of this and a couple more things is what Docker actually is, which is a software container platform. In addition, that I want to mention over run C and container D, Docker comes with SE Linux and AppArmor profiles, so it already comes with secure by default profiles that just by doing Docker run, you inherit. So effectively, a container D container or a run C container, they don't know what profiles you want to run. Docker comes with opinionated profiles to ensure effectively a good balance be between usability and security. It also comes with a capability whitelist. So there's something in Linux, which is capabilities, which is dividing the authority that the root user has in smaller subpieces. And when you run a Docker container, you have less than half of the capabilities that you have in root by default. And again, there's a good compromise between usability and security by default. We also have a system called whitelist that allows us to mitigate surface of exposure of the kernel. If by any chance somebody compromises the container and tries to attack the operating system kernel from the container, 
we're mitigating some of that surface of attack because system calls are being whitelisted. And dangerous system calls that we've removed from the whitelist can't be actually called. So if there's an exploit or a vulnerability in those, it doesn't actually affect your system. Then finally, as I mentioned, node reintegration comes by default. You just enable it, and all of a sudden, you can use a very simple way, Docker pull, Docker push, with the sophistication of Notary and the ability of having integrity end-to-end, -end. multiple signatures, survivable key compromise, so on and so forth. And this brings me to the last Tetronimo that Docker's created, which is called SwarmKit. Not last in order, but the last that I'm going to talk, to you, talk, talk about today. SwarmKit is a least privileged container orchestrator. What that means is that we took extreme care in Swarm to ensure that each node that is executing your containers only has access to the resources and to the code and to the containers that it needs for its purpose. No more, no less. And I'm going to go over a few details as to why this is true and all the things that we had to go through to ensure that this was true. And the first one has to do with secure node introduction. Running containers in one host is great, but if you want to scale it across multiple nodes and you're constantly adding and removal nodes, removing nodes, you have to have a secure way of introducing these new nodes to your cluster in a way that you know is trusted and that no attacker can either join a node, join a node to the cluster or man in the middle the join of a, of, a, of a node to the cluster or impersonate a node in your cluster. So we created a mechanism um, that, that uses secure node introduction that is actually pretty simple. It's based on a token that you are probably familiar with. There are things that are similar. You provide a token to join a node, and that token ensures several things. Number one, ensures that there's end-to-end -end security, so the node trusts the cluster, and the cluster knows that this node has the authority of joining. And it also allows you to issue a certificate for each individual node. And a certificate is actually going to turn to be the identity that each node in a swarm cluster is going to use for the lifetime of the duration of this node in the cluster. So every single node, by just joining a swarm, immediately gets an X509 certificate, which, as you know, is the normal type of certificates that you use in your PKI. But we do that all for you. By just you running Docker Swarm init, automatically a certificate authority gets created for you, certificates start being generated, and certificates start being rotated automatically. And for the people in the audience that actually care about these things, this is what a certificate looks like. It has a couple of characteristics, but one that I want to mention is the CN is the node ID. That is a unique, randomly generated ID that is going to live throughout the lifetime of your node that you can actually trust. Instead of having a name or host name in a node that you can't trust, you have a cryptographic identity for every single node in your cluster. And this is going to become really important, because now that we have a cryptographic identity for each node of our cluster, we can do something really cool. We can have mutual TLS between every single one of our nodes. So in this cluster, when you join a node, automatically all the communications between the nodes and the managers, the managers being the more privileged nodes and the workers effectively being just the nodes that are going to execute our containers, everything has mutual TLS. So the nodes authorize the managers, and the managers authorize the nodes. The nodes know what specific manager they're talking to, and the managers know what specific nodes they're talking to. This is really important, because if we're using TLS, it means that we have confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity of every single communication. It means that everything that we send to a worker, such as secrets, it is encrypted in transit. Right? Every single secret that we send to the node, there's no man in the middle that can intercept the secret for us. And so this is actually something that is not true of um, a lot of other orchestrators out there. When you set up a lot of other orchestrators, you don't have TLS by default. You have open access to secrets. There's no authenticity. Everybody can access everything. And so for us, the least privilege and the secure by default principles came together into let us give you a CA that comes by default that gives you these properties. And now that we actually have mutual TLS, because we have identities that are being rotated for you automatically as, um, as, um, as low as every hour. So you can rotate certificates automatically every hour if you want to. And we have certificates that are your identities that are being rotated automatically for you without you doing anything. And so on top of this, we can now do secure secret distribution. So when you're running in a swarm, we wanted a way for you to get secrets such as tokens or private keys or TLS certificates for your apps 
securely to the actual containers. How do we do that? These are sent over the network. How do we know we're getting to the right containers? Well, we're building on the primitives that we got so far. Since we securely introduced the node to the cluster, we know that there's no rogue nodes in the cluster. Since we issued cryptographic node identities to each node, we know exactly what nodes we're sending this information to. And since we're using mutual TLS for all the communications, we know that these secrets are being delivered securely to the final nodes that are going to use them. So this is really important. It allows us to actually just spread the secrets, run containers, rotate secrets in a secure fashion. Another thing that I want to mention is, by default, the secrets that you add to a swarm get stored in the managers and get automatically replicated, obviously, for full tolerance. But they get encrypted at rest, again, by default. So there's no component of the system that does not come turned on. And you can tune it, but the choices that are done for you from the get-go are the right ones. So now let me tell you a little bit about transparent root rotation. I talked about this concept of survivable key compromise for Notary, which was the concept where if a key gets compromised, you don't have to do anything but click a button and the key rotates for you. This is something that I care deeply about and that is really important in security. Because the first thing you have to do when you compromise is to rotate all the keys. But if you have a cluster that doesn't allow you to rotate all the keys, what do you do? You have to create a cluster from scratch. And so with Swarm, we took a lot of care in making sure that everything in the cluster allows you to be rotated. The secrets, you can rotate them, add a new secret, and automatically will be distributed to all the containers. But now the question becomes, what about the root key? What about the CA? the certificate authority that is actually issuing the certificates to the nodes. What happens to that certificate authority? What if a manager gets compromised? Because if a worker gets compromised, we know how to remove it from the cluster, we delete the certificate, and everything is good. But if the manager gets compromised, the manager has access to certificate authority. The manager effectively allows new nodes to join the system and issues those identities for the nodes. So it has the key material of the root CA. What do we do then? Well, and this is where a lot of security engineers disagree. And I usually disagree and have a, a kind of different opinion. Usually security engineers, we're drawing this on a board, we create a manager, we have all these workers, and when they come to this problem, they say, oh, if an attacker compromises the manager, we're screwed, there's nothing we can do, let's just do a new cluster. For me, the answer is not shrug, let's just create a new cluster. The reality is that the majority of the times, you don't have attackers compromising your cluster. The majority of the times, what happened was that somebody posted the private key to GitHub, or somebody backed it up to a place that it shouldn't have. And so you need the ability of actually rotating from this situation. And so now we have the problem of we're trusting one route, but we don't know how to rotate it. So with Swarm, we went one step above and did something that I've never seen any orchestrator out there do. And we allow you to actually rotate the route of trust. And the way that we do it is actually turns out to be pretty simple. You have trust in the blue certificate authority. If you want to rotate it, you create a new red certificate authority. But what you do is you create an intermediate. So you sign the new root with the old root. And so now you have two roots in the managers. But at this point, all the nodes still trust each other, and all the nodes only believe in blue. The next step is we go through all the nodes and issue a new certificate for every single one of these nodes. But the new certificate is not going to be signed by blue. The new certificate is going to be signed by a chain of red, of blue, red, and red. So what it means is that all the nodes are going to get a new certificate that is actually issued by red, but trusted by blue, because it is an actual intermediate, and therefore there's a chain from red to red to blue that every single node trusts. The reason why this is important is because while you're rotating these, the nodes have to trust each other. So it doesn't matter if a node has an old certificate from blue or a node already has a new certificate from red, they have to communicate with each other, and therefore they have to trust each other. So this is why this step is, is important. And so after we do this first pass, we can actually and verify that all the nodes have a certificate that is then issued by red, we can go in and actually um, take blue away and only trust red. And so now we went from we don't trust blue or we trust blue to we no longer trust blue. We completely rotated the root of trust of the certificate authority. OK, so now let's actually bring it all together. I showed you seven different tetronomos. Every single one have different security properties. All of them could use, be used independently. So let's actually use them. First combination that I want to do is Notary and Docker. 
What happens if I bring Notary and Docker? Well, if I bring Notary and Docker, what I have is cryptograph cryptographically verified pulls. Notary is ensuring the authenticity of the content. Docker is running. So it doesn't matter if there's a cloud. If you're hosting the content or the images on an HTTP mirror, completely unencrypted, S3, you are ignoring effectively the trust of what's in the middle. The final container executor, your final Docker host, is only trusting the key, not the intermediate place where it's stored. This is great. What if we do SwarmKit and join it with Docker? Well, in this case, these two tetronomos together, what they're going to give you is they're going to give you an authorized, authenticated, and encrypted way of effectively communicating between all nodes. OK, that's cool. By itself, not particularly useful. But we can continue. What if we join the tetronomo InfraKit with SwarmKit? What you're going to have is, for any system that you want, a secure way of doing node introduction. I described to you in general terms how that worked, the ability of having a token that secures end-to-end -end certificate issuance. It does not have to be used with Docker. You can use it for your own machines, for anything in your infrastructure. What if we put Linux Kit and use it as the base OS builder? Well, obviously what we're going to get is hardened configuration. We're going to get an operating system that is minimal, comes with secure defaults, and it comes actually built from the ground up to be least privileged. And we can continue. Let's connect Notary and um, SwarmKit. Let's see what actually happens there, or Notary and Linux Kit. What we're going to have now is when you're building a Linux Kit OS, if you're using Notary, now you have cryptographically verified builds. Every component of your operating system that is being pulled in is being cryptographically verified with Notary. That's awesome. Can we continue going down this path? Well, let's try to get InfraKit plus Notary for OS provisioning. If we now add InfraKit plus Notary plus Linux Kit, what do we get? We get something that is awesome, which is cryptographically verified boots. So InfraKit spins up a virtual machine. It uses Notary to resolve the secure hash that it should be running. And then it can use Linux Kit to do DM Verity. DM Verity is a Linux capability that allows you to ensure if the image running on the remote host is the image that you actually wanted. And so there's no way for an attacker to mess with your supply chain and to load a malicious image in your virtual machines or in your hosts because you're cryptographically verifying it. And so this is something that we might do in the future, but it's a cool way of combining these building blocks into something really cool. But we can keep going. What if we layer run C, container D, and Docker? Well, we obviously get a secure by default container execution, which is what Docker provides you by default when you install it and just do Docker run. Now that we're in the complex ones, what if we add run C, container D, Docker, SwarmKit, and Notary. Just jumble them all together. What does this get us? Well, it gets us a secure by default container platform. It allows you to have the execution of containers, secure distribution of secrets, secure node introduction, and containers being executed with run C, container D, in a least privileged manner. And now the obvious final question is, what happens if we put all of this stuff together, all of the tetronomals, and just like put them in? Well, what you get is secure by default infrastructure. You get remote at the station, verification from the boot, golden images being created with minimal Linux Kit OSs, running minimal Docker containers that have secure default configurations in a cluster that has mutual TLS and secure secret distribution, all with the digital signatures of Notary and key transparent key rotation. So in terms of conclusion today, I talked to you about InfraKit the way that you can do machine management in Docker, or for any system, really. We talked to you about the ability of having um, Linux Kit, the minimal image secure building. We talked a little bit about Run C, we talked a little bit about Container D, and we talked a little bit about Docker itself. And then finally, we talked about Notary, which is the way that you do digital signature verification. And we talked about SwarmKit, which is the way that you do container orchestrator. So what happens when you bring all these pieces together? You get the Moby Whale. Thank you very much. And just so, just so you know, it took me 20 minutes of my life to do this animation, so I'm going to do it again. And there you go. <laughs> all, all the pieces came together in the end. So we had a few questions that were submitted to the app, and I want to read them out loud. So this is the question. Dugger has done a great job at providing mechanisms for securing infrastructure. 
When will we see Docker do the same for application code executed inside a container? That's an excellent question. Um, I would say that we already have it right now. So if you think about it, when you're running an application and you put it in a Docker container, the only thing you're doing is you're securing it. You're adding more security. You're by default adding the ability of mitigating access to the host. You have capabilities that are dropped. You have Linux security profiles. You have minimal exposure to the kernel. And you obviously have contained a view and um, in, in terms of resource, you have an app that is now segregated from the OS. So if nothing else, you don't change anything in your system. The only thing you do is you have your current system, but then you put your application inside of Docker. You're effectively making them more secure by default, the virtue of putting in Docker itself. This said, we're going one step above. We have something like, um, that is called Docker security scanning that scans images, Docker images, for vulnerabilities. And so if your application has a vulnerability, such as Heartbleed, that will be detected. So the, fa the fact that it's in a format that everybody knows, you can use tools, like CoreOS has a tool called Claire, uh, we have Docker security scanning, but just the fact that Docker has a known format of an image is already helping the security of your infrastructure because everybody knows how to scan it, everybody knows how to unpack it, everybody knows how to look at the binaries for vulnerabilities. And as time goes on, these things are only getting better. The default mechanisms of isolation of Docker are only getting better, which means that the security of your applications is only getting better. If you have a crappy PHP application that has remote code execution on it, if somebody goes into it, you can actually just run Docker containers, Docker run, dash, dash, read only. And now nobody can write to the Docker container. The attacker has remote code execution, but it can't download payloads. It can't compile tools. It can't attack the kernel. It makes lateral movement a lot harder. So my argument is it already does help your application security, and it's only going to do more in the future. All right, last question. It's uh, the questionnaire here says relatively basic question. So Docker and UFW has bitten me exposing data to the public web while I thought uh, UFW ensured limited access. What is your recommendation on IP whitelisting access Docker to Docker containers? So I think IP, IP white, uh, white, um, whitelisting is not a security feature. I don't think you should ever use IP whitelisting for any kind of security. The right way of exposing things to the internet, if that is your goal, is to use TLS. So you can configure Docker to actually just listen on TLS. And if you don't have to listen on the internet, then just listen on localhost or use the default uh, Docker socket. Docker doesn't listen on the network by default. So close your firewalls, close your ports. Unless you know what you're doing, do not expose your Docker to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much.